Hear that? That's the sound of a patient whose health data is protected from a cyber attack. And that, that's the sound of a financial system that's digitally secured from bad actors. Right now, there's an invisible war being fought on a digital battlefield that impacts what we do every day. That's why at Paraton, we do the can't be done to help protect the vital systems we rely on. Because if we don't, the alternative is unimaginable. Paraton. You could save big when you bundle your home and auto with Progressive, but when we just come out and say it, it feels like it falls a bit flat. So instead, we're going to hire a professional voice actor and pay him absurd amounts of money to say, I like this product. Hmm, not sure why that was better. I mean, I'm a professional too. But we didn't pay him to say the business part, so back to me. Save big when you bundle your home and auto with Progressive. Sorry, I know hearing me say it was a bit of a letdown. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discount not available in all states or situations. Welcome to the Real Estate Strategies Podcast, where we host in-depth conversations on everything real estate with the industry's biggest movers and shakers. I'm your host, Ken McElroy, joined by my co-host, Daniil. Let's get right into this episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Ken McElroy Show. I'm your host, Daniil, here with Ken. What's happening, everybody? Everyone wants to know now about the Fed and inflation and what they're doing about inflation. Well, I'm doing a learning video on this today. So nice. And it'll be released in the next week or so. Yeah, but mm-hmm. I so I'm very up to speed on this issue. It's I'm I'm excited about doing the video, so it'll it'll be released. What do you think, Jerry? Maybe a week? A week? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Oh, for this Friday. All right. Oh, It'll be out this it's Friday. Be released Friday. So yeah. So I'm going to do a video. I'm already prepared for it. It's going to be exciting. But I, I talk about three different things. The first one is inflation. The second one is obviously interest rates or the Fed funds rate. And the third is what is that going to do to real estate itself? Nice. And and I think that if you really go back and and kind of unwind this. The Fed has been clear the whole time. They've said our target inflation rate is 2%. That's what Powell continues to say. That's what he said last week. That's what he said last month. That's what he said months ago. That's what he said last year. Their target inflation rate is 2%. They consider that, right or wrong, they consider that, that the economy is growing at a 2% rate. Of course, we all know we're at 9.1%. And um, if you're outside of the U.S., in some places, it's significantly higher. Yeah, and I guess the question is, is if they're really going to hit that 2% mark. Because he does keep saying it, but the more I listen to different economists and the more I'm you know, doing research myself, is that if we go to hit 2%, it's going gonna, it's gonna to put us into a depression, straight, straight up. I mean, they can't get us into 2% without massively slowing down the economy, massive job loss. And the question is, is are they really going to do that? Or are they going to settle for like 5 6 7% inflation? Well, I don't know that. I, I think this is kind of in that same discussion as, is this transitory? Like, <laughs> the, there's been nothing that said that the Fed is going to, oh, hey, we, we said 2, now it's 5. It's 2. Right now, they're targeting two. Can they get to two? And, and what will happen with the economy? Different issue. So they might adjust, mm-hmm. but there's a number of variables, a number of variables. There is. But, you know, what I want to chat about today was just if if they're going to accept higher inflation, because that's what a lot of people think, that they're just going to accept it. They're just going to be like, you know what? We got it down from nine to five, and that's great. And this is just what we're rolling with for right now then you guys have to understand what to do with your money in times of high inflation because, you know, inflation is not going away anytime soon. Whether they get us to 2% or 5% or whatever their baseline is, it's not happening for a while, for years. So you need to understand what to do when you're in times of high inflation because we're going to be there for a while. Well, but you have to go back to what's happened. If you take a look at the the interest rates that the Fed, uh, it's called the federal funds rate. That's the most important rate for you to watch. So in 2000, is it 2020? Um, and the federal funds rate went to zero. 
So what can you explain what the federal funds so rate is? Yeah, the federal funds rate is basically the borrowing rate for the banks. So the banks are getting charged more. And then, of course, they charge consumers more and things cost of money goes up. So the point is this. They use the interest rate to manipulate inflation. That's what they do. That They use it to cool the economy or heat up the economy. That's historically what the Fed does. They also, of course, are in charge of unemployment. Um, there's also a spin job going on around that. They're saying, how can, how can we be in a recession you know, with this healthy employment? Um, I don't want to go down that road today, but the point is, what we have is we had a, a period of very, very cheap money chasing goods, and it drove the prices up. That's it. Drove cars up, it drove houses up. You know, there was a time when we were buying properties and rates were, say, 5 or 6%. That wasn't very long ago. And, you know, I've been doing this for 20 plus years. And, and then they kept going down. They were going to 4% and then into 3%. Well, what happens is you start to stretch for the price of that property. So everybody forgets that the, the lowering of the interest rates created the asset prices to go up. The lowering of the interest rates uh, made borrowing easier, made money cheaper, and it created this bubble we're in. That's it. So the only thing that's happening is it's being reversed, and everybody's freaking out. And this is part of the cycle. It's just everybody's not happy with <laughs> this part. Yeah, people hate this part, you know. Well, I, I'm curious of your guys' opinion. Like, if you think that the Fed's going to take us down to 2% or if you think it's going to take us, like, higher than that, I'd like your opinion. So make sure you type it in. Yeah, I, I don't think that the Fed's going to – they're going to have to watch the economy as a whole, of course. But nobody, nobody knows what's going to happen. But I can tell you this. They've publicly, historically, and in print on the Fed's – Web website says it's 2%. Yeah. Okay, so that means we're 7% away. Right. And we've had four increases this year. Well, and those increases have put yeah. the real estate market uh, almost to And a they hole. haven't helped inflation. Yeah, Inflation's gone inflation up. Yet. That's the real issue. Inflation has gone up. And it, well, last, I think last time it was reported it was 8. Now it's mm -hmm. 9. Before that it was, I can't remember, 6 or 7. But the point is, inflation's gone up, and I, I think a lot of people would argue whether or not that that's a real number as well, is the reported inflation rate. But inflation's out of control, and uh, I think the Fed's going to do everything they can to get it in control. And I don't think that people want to live with 4 or 5% inflation rate. I don't think the Fed is going to adopt that either. Yeah, but they also don't want to live with no jobs and, you know, a slow, slow, slow economy. Who, the, the Fed? No, the people. Well, yeah, yeah, but uh, I think we're talking about the what the Fed's going to do, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the Fed, I, I think, is going to try to get down to that two percent target rate. It's possible that they might not, but at this point, that's where they're headed. And so I don't see, you know, I see as I've already said publicly, I I think interest rates are going to go. I think they're going to be seven, eight percent even by the end of the year. Um, the real estate market is in serious trouble right now. We're in the first quarter, guys. That's it. Yeah. That's what we have to look at. It. There's this interesting thing right now between sellers and buyers. Sellers, they're just in pure denial. <laughs> That's all. Well, right. We were in Coeur d'Alene and, you know, there were so many houses listed, way more than normal. And they weren't selling because we, we were there for 30 days. And as you guys know, things have been flying off the shelf. And, you know... They don't want to reduce their prices yet um, because they still have this arrogance about them. But they are, are going to have to come to the realization that we're in a slower market. We're in higher rates. And we were talking to our friends last night about this. And, you know, these people, they tried to time the market as the problem. They were greedy. And this is what we always tell you guys not to do is time the market. So they waited. They wanted to sell at the peak, right? So they waited and they waited. And as you guys know, the last two years have been great. They would have listed that house. It would have sold in 30 days. But then it would just go up a little bit more every month. So they just wanted to wait, wait, wait. So now that it's peaking and things are frozen, they're like, oh, crap, we have to sell right now. So now they're listing for this price they could have got 60 days ago. And it's sitting. Right. And that's why we tell you guys to not time the market. Don't get 
get greedy because if they needed to sell and they would have sold a few months ago or last year, they would have probably made numbers that they might not make this year. Yeah. You guys are, a lot of people are just basically gambling. They're gambling that the real estate's going to keep going up. I've been through many, many uh, expansions and contractions. And I've learned, you know, in my early days, I used to try to time the market too. And then I started moving to a, what I would call a, a cash flow model as opposed to a capital gain model. A lot of you guys are have never seen a market that's gone down. So welcome. This is where we are. We're in the first quarter of this. And I think it's I think real estate is going to get um, a lot worse this year. We're, we're seeing higher interest rates, higher cap rates, higher listings. OK, <laughs> like those are facts. So you can't argue those. So, the, you know, that additional supply. Yes, we have affordability. Yes, we are undersupplied. Yes, you can hang on to those and try to sell whatever you're going to sell and believe whatever you're going to believe. But the truth is we have more listings, more interest rates, higher interest rates, I should say, and higher cap rates. And that means that uh, you're going to start seeing more supply. And uh, I think you're going to have some affordability issues. People people can't afford. The mortgages have jumped so much for the prices in, in the last few months. And um, this is this is the other side of it. Yes. I'm answering Shane right now. He said he had a lease expired this summer and made the decision to keep holding and list it to lease again rather than sell because of your advice. Yeah. I, I like guys like, you know, if you're trying to time the market, then... Um, you you might be sorely uh, disappointed. I, I was talking to, uh, you, you know, you guys know we have a, a mastermind that we do four times a year called The Collective with George Gammon and Jason Hartman. And I was talking to one of our members last night, and he has many properties under construction in Florida. And he's very, very concerned for a couple of reasons. One, um, he doesn't know what the prices are going to be for the construction. So that's the first thing I told him to make, try to figure out. The second thing is he can't put any debt on them because they're not done. So the bank's not going to finance something that's half built, three quarters built, or, you know, in the middle of construction. The, you know, you have to have the property completed. You have to have what's called the certificate of occupancy. You have to have all those things done, and the city has to sign off on all that stuff. So he, he thinks that the things are uh, the, these places are going to be done by the end of the year. Well, problem is we don't know what interest rates are going to be at the end of the year. So he doesn't know what it's going to cost to complete, and he doesn't know what his takeout financing is. So typically, construction financing typically is higher than traditional financing or fixed permanent financing because think about construction financing or interest is at more risk and so when you have a property that's under construction the bank's at more at risk because the property there's n there's no real collateral so typically those interest rates are a little higher um, so you're going to start to see this move but the real issue that he has is he he had bought these properties based on an economic model um, of six months ago. And um, that's the real issue. You know, they thought it's going to cost X to build. And he believed at the time that his financing was going to be somewhere in the 4% range. Well, those days are gone. So now he has to take a look at the reality of, of, of what the mortgage is going to be at the end of the year. And, and this is, this is the issue. A lot of flippers have, this is the issue. A lot of builders have, this is the, this is the issue of anybody trying to trade. So let's say, let's say, you know, my, my, our friends in, in Seattle where they were just trying to make a lateral move from, from one home to the next for about the same price but their mortgage payment was significantly higher because of the one that they already had on their home, so they stayed in place. So um, real estate's going to slow down, and the people that have to get out on these listings, they're going to start dumping them. I think you're going to start to see. Uh, the The interesting thing is, is the cost of housing is not going to go down, <laughs> which is horrible because mm -hmm. of the supply chain stuff, and um, I think interest rates are going to continue to go up. 
And when you say cost of housing, you mean rent. I'm talking about the the physical the 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 price of a stove, the price of a washer dryer, the price of a uh, the paint, the price of a roof, the price of labor, all that stuff. You know, so the actual physical cost of of ho- of a home, unfortunately, is going up. At the same time, interest rates are going up. So that's why um, you know if you own something, you know, we, as I you know I was telling well I showed you this week. <laughs> Like it's crazy. I, I think I, I've said that you know we're building a project in um, Tucson. When we started it, we did I think twenty million in equity and forty million of debt or something, um, and we projected it to be you know somewhere around ninety million when it's done, somewhere between eighty and ninety million. We just got an appraisal for one hundred twelve million, so you know the the, the values are up. Um, and, um, you know, but now we're not going to sell it. Of course, you guys know we're holders, so it doesn't really matter that we have, you know, call it 60 million of equity in this property, but the, you know, it's going to matter for a cash out refinance, but at the same token, what's my interest rate going to be? Right. And the property's not done. So we, so we definitely have some questions coming here. It says mediating Frenchie said, aren't actual prices of homes going to go down with a higher supply? I believe they are. Yes, I, I, you know, I think the residential market and the multifamily market and the commercial market, a commercial office and commercial retail, they're all very different. Industrial, they all act differently based on supply and demand. I think. Well, if you look, listings are up. They're up in Phoenix. They're up in Austin. They're up in a lot of markets. They're down in some too, though. They're up. They're down in Miami of all places. Uh, you know, uh, who knows why, but. There are markets that are, you know, people are still clamoring for to buy stuff. And there are markets where it's going the other direction. The, you know, and, and I, I think the, uh, of course, real estate is not national. It's local. And even even in some market to some market, it can be de- very different. Yeah. And Mark wanted to know, do rents stagnate or drop with increased interest rates? It's a good question. So, um Here's typically, it depends on uh, the rents rents are, and interest rates are independent of each other. So it's a, it's a very, very good question, Mark. Um, rents are predicated by mar- the market, period, the market. So if, if there's an undersupply of housing in a market, then traditionally rents will grow. If there's a if there's a demand for the number of people looking for rentals, which is, I believe, where we're heading, then the then rents will grow. So now on the other side of that, the owner of the whatever the house is or the multifamily uh, property is, if they don't have fixed rate debt, then their interest rate um, could go up and their mortgage rate or their mortgage payment could go up. It really operates independently. In some cases, rent will cover the mortgage price increase the mortgage increase in some cases. And so some landlords are going to, um, they're going to be in a better situation because of the rents are going up. If you raise them <laughs> and if you can raise them, depends on the market. Yeah. I mean, just because, you know, some markets, the rent goes up, other markets, it doesn't, but that's kind of why we preach about this, um, fixed rate mortgage, right? We are not really a big fan in these times of an adjustable rate mortgage, if you're in an adjustable rate mortgage, we suggest that you fix it. Well, you did that. You mm-hmm. you decided uh, what a couple months ago. Yeah, I fixed my. Yeah. I had an equity line and I changed it to an equity loan and I fixed the rate, even though the rate went up about a percentage and a yeah. half. It but you still were, made but sense. you wanted certainty of the mm-hmm. payment. You wanted certainty of the. You wanted to guy. This is about it. This is in stock. You just hedge. This is a hedge. You want to know what your your mortgage payment is going to be in two or three or four years. Yeah, you don't. It could honestly, guys. We don't really know. Like, part you know, people are thinking the Fed's going to just decrease the rate again just to stimulate the economy. Other people think it could go up to twenty percent. I mean, you really don't know, you know. And so you just have to hedge your bet and fix your rate. You can always drop it later if it goes down. Guys, the 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 Fed is not going to increase rates four times this year and then all of a sudden decide to lower them. Okay? We're at 9.1% inflation. Okay, and inflation has gone up all year. So why would they just all of a sudden go, "You know, I know we're at 9. Now we're going to lower the rate." That's not happening. They're going to continue to raise rates. The next time they meet is in September. 
Um, and, um, you, you know, uh, they're going to look at the data during that time. And the, the data is, uh, this is not going to be, even if it's, even if inflation goes to eight or seven, I, they're not going to, they're not going to take the foot off the gas for, uh, for rising, uh, the, the federal funds rate. Yeah. And so that's why we like real estate, right? Because it moves with inflation. For those of you that are tenants, you know that your rents are going to keep going up most likely because there's a supply and demand, you know, a supply issue. Um, So we like real estate because rents move with inflation and home prices move with inflation. And so that's why we're trying to get you guys to invest in real estate. Stop being a renter, you know, stop being somebody's tenant and start actually owning some property. Well, inflation's good for hard assets. So as you guys know, things are going up in price. So the Fed can't print oil. It can't print housing. It can print money and it can manipulate the rates. Okay. It can't print gold. So those are things. That's why there's so much stuff on the internet around these hard assets. So you want to be in hard assets because those usually respond favorably during inflationary times. And just go back and look into the 70s and you'll see, you know, which was a very, very high inflationary time, you know, or any time after, let's say, a war or, you know, just go back and look at history. You'll see which just type in what, you know, which assets performed favorably during inflationary times. And you'll see just just do that and then you know uh you know don't try to reinvent the wheel here you know just go back and look at history and then and then be out in in front of it and you know but we are facing i still think some pretty heavy inflationary times well and sarah made a good comment on youtube she's like uh, jerome powell said last week it will be at least 18 to 24 months until it levels out. So levels out does not mean goes to 2%. Levels yeah. out basically means stabilizes. Sarah, that's a great comment. I, yeah. One of the things that I don't think people understand about is what I what I call lag. And a lot of people don't look at lag. So right now, as an example, the the rates have gone up pretty quickly in the in you know this year. Well, the sellers are like, what just happened? It's almost like a boxer that took a shot in the head and, you know, staggering around, doesn't quite understand what's happening. And, you know, the Fed's about ready to knock them a couple more times, you, you know, and it's happened. I mean, the, I think the the three quarters of a, of a rate for the last two times were the largest since 1994. That should say, that should tell you something. You know, those are big shots to the body. Well, the the sell there the they're sitting the boxers or the sellers are sitting there going oh you know I think it's real estate's fine and they're still they're still working off of the you know their old narrative and um, you know and trust me this is not going away anytime soon guys I'm telling you like the nine percent is high people are in trouble people are having a tough time paying for gas paying for food and this is what they're trying to to solve yes. Uh, Rusty Pilot wanted to know if your Tucson project will cash flow when completed with the anticipated rate. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, we had massive, massive rent growth during that period of time. We're in lease up, so we're not raising people's rents. So um, we're building a project. So 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 when we open, we're going to open with a lot higher rents. So uh, we're in the process of taking a look at that. But my guess is it's going to be probably not as much as we wanted. In other words, back when it was sixty million, and we thought rates were going to be say in the in the threes. Um, and we're over budget on the construction. So we're over budget on construction. Our interest rates going to be higher. Um, but y- you know, we're going to have a significantly higher on, um, on the rents, but we're also having higher expenses. Uh, I don't know if you know this guys, but the, uh, the property assessors are going after landlords like crazy. So we're, ha- we're hearing some crazy stories. And so we're starting to see that, uh, we last week, uh, as a company, we were we, we looked at twenty some different projects that we own, and uh, you know specifically in Texas, they're coming after us hard. You, you know, and we're we're talking about and just in Austin, if you can imagine this, you, you know we're looking at uh, a three hundred thousand dollar increase in our property tax bill annually, three hundred thousand. So that's like twenty five G's a month. That um, you know, so so 
all this stuff's starting to catch up. And, and, uh, and so all of that, it's a long uh, answer to, I don't know yet, <laughs> but uh, w- we have looked at it. We think it's going to be fine. But the, here's what we will do. Even though it's appraised at 112 grand, 112,000 or 112 million, let's say, we might not get, we not, might not maximize the leverage. We might just make sure that the leverage is low. Because all I'm trying to do, if you remember, is I'm just trying to pay my investors back their 20 million plus the cost of that money. So I'm going to be solving to that. I'm going to be solving. I want to get all the investors back. That's called a tax-free cash-out refi. So the good news is, is even if I put an $80 million loan on it, um, I, I only, I think I, uh, I think our construction loan was somewhere around $40 million. So we're way in the money. We're going to be able to pay all our investors back, which is good. Um, and we'll solve to the payment and solve to the cash flow, but at the same time, trying to get everybody the money back. It's a good question. And Joseph has a good comment. You know, he said, does the cost of construction trend tend to go down with the slower real estate market? And it does, but it just takes time. Yeah, but again, back to lag. So, yes, the, it, is a, it doesn't happen quickly, but um, it will happen. So, interest rates drive new construction. They drive, um, you know, consumption. So... As as, um, as 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 borrowing costs go up and the economy starts to cool, then there'll be less um, jobs and mm-hmm. there'll be less things happening. There'll be less construction for sure because um, the numbers won't make sense. And um, so yes, but it does. It's going to take a while. Um, Jamie said you got a tan and you're looking good. <laughs> Uh, I play golf. <laughs> I've been playing a lot of golf. So Nello uh, said, in what scenario could a 5-1 adjustable rate mortgage make sense? So explain to everyone what a 5-1 arm is. Yeah. So adjust- arm means adjustable rate mortgage. So, again, it's adjustable. Um, I think that's, a, if I'm recalling, it's a five-year mm-hmm. uh, with a, with a uh, is that right, Jerry? Is it 5-1, five, five, one, five year? It's a five-year adjustable rate mortgage. I, 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 I don't know. Again, this is, you, you know, the problem with adjustable rate mortgages is that you don't know what the rates are going to be. Uh, that's why they're adjustable. So this, you really got to dig into the into the the, the fine print here. It makes here. sense. It, you know, you might not want to pay more for that, you know, 15, 30 or fixed. But at the same time, it might be worth it. If in five years it's way up and you're having to refinance at that. Yeah. If you're a long-term holder... Um, I would fix right now and I would just lock it in and then see what happens. You know, it's possible that the, you know, the, the interest rates, uh, I think the rise in interest rates are going to crash the real estate market over time. Uh, and the people that are sitting on these adjustables are going to be in trouble. And, um, if they need out, if they need out and if they don't cash flow. So those are the two things. If they don't cash flow and they need out, they're, they're going to be in trouble because remember, if you're trying to sell, you got to think of the buyer, not you, <laughs> the right. buyer. What's the buyer willing to pay for? And what's their mortgage payment going to be? Is it going to be a personal or is it going to be an investment? And um, either way. So if the investment um, side, if the mortgage payment doesn't cover the, 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 the expenses and the rent, or if the rent doesn't cover the expenses of the mortgage payment, then, then, uh, you could be in trouble. And this could be the very beginning of a very rough time. Yes, yes. Um, and we're going to get into that here in a second about, you know, being careful if you're starting into real estate investing. Uh, first, make sure you hit the like button. really helps us out. Second is don't forget to check out my webinar here in a couple of weeks with Van Sturgeon. He is going to explain how to hire and manage contractors. So this is all he does, um, and he is very good at it. So we're going to go over all that. It's a free webinar, just KenMcRoy.com forward slash webinar. So a lot of people are talking about getting into, you know, a lot of people want to start syndicating, right? Yeah. They want to start, you know, they want, they're a new investor or a new syndicator and they want to start raising money. It's a tough time to do that right now if you don't have experience. Guys, this is not the time, trust me. Or if you're thinking about investing with somebody that's new. Yeah, yeah. So you got to remember, first of all, it's a great time to actually start to study this. Great time. But if you're, 
you know, the, the one thing that's going to pay back your investors is the actual real estate itself, period. It's not you. It's not, yeah, it doesn't really, you have to, there has to be, you have to create value for your investors. So you're buying here and you're creating value, hopefully up. And if you can do that, then do that. But this is not the time to, to learn about, you know, how to, how to syndicate, in my opinion. This is, the, you got cap rates that are going up. And what does that mean? What that means is if a cap rate goes from 4% to 5%, that means that you've lost 20%, 4 to 5 is 20% of the value based on the existing operations. So it's possible that operations go up, but you might do all kinds of things right. You might have a massive value add. You might say, this looks good on paper. What you don't know is the exit. And, and I, you know, we've been studying, um, two weeks ago, uh, my, one of my analysts went out and, and looked at all these different syndicators out there and, and what they were doing to raise capital. And I was shocked. There are, you know, in some cases, some of these syndicators are just doing it for the fees, in my opinion. There's no way that, uh, for, for an example, if you're going to raise money at 10%, which many are, 8 9 10%, there is no way, no way. I'm looking at hundreds and hundreds of deals, guys. Hundreds. Uh, I've got two analysts full time. I got acquisition guys looking all over the country, and you know we're, we're scrubbing so many deals. You have no idea, and and uh, none of them produce that kind of return. So what you have is you have the cost of equity might be eight, nine, ten percent. But the things, these properties are producing hardly anything. And so the entire game is based on the exit. So the question is, what will the exit be? And if you can't solve to that, if you can't arguably predict that, then, um, you, you know, this, this whole, you're just going to be raising capital and, um, and holding property long term. You have some very upset investors. So now we're going to jump in to our questions from our inner circle. To sign up for this, go to kensinnercircle.com. We answer all the questions, either verbally or in writing. Um, and our first question today comes from Kumar. And he said, hi, Ken. I want to buy a rental property, but all the properties I've looked at won't cash flow or they require major work. What can I do in an overpriced market? Yeah. Well, um, it's a great question. So first of all, I do believe that you have to look at lots of properties. So I don't know what lots of properties means to you, but for us, we probably look at over a hundred and maybe offer on less than 10. So I don't know what your numbers are, but I think that's important. So it's very probable that the majority of the properties that you're looking at are going to be overpriced. Secondly, um, on the ones that need lots of work, I'm wondering whether or not you actually have uh, a nice value add component there. So I personally love properties that need a lot of work because that's what I call forced equity. So forced equity means that you take something that's existing, you put some money into it, and it's worth more. So it's worth more rent and it's worth more um, as, uh, uh, at the value as well. So you got to be careful here because of course we've all seen people over improve. Um, it, we were, I was talking to one of my, um, I was talking to another acquisition guy at another company last week. And he said, there's a, there's, there's a, uh, an apartment syndicator out there that's putting $35,000 into each unit. <laughs> I mean, that's insane. The most we've ever done is 15. So now I don't know what you get from 15 to 35, but um, I can't imagine it's a lot more than what we're doing because you know, I've been doing this a long time. We have $68 million in renovations right now. And, and uh, our average is right around 12 to 15,000 per unit. 
Now it's going up a little bit because appliances are up and carpets up and floorings up and paints up and plumbing fixtures are up and all that kind of stuff. But um, the the point is, is there might be some value there for, for uh, to, to to take a look at. But um, this is the greatest time to be looking and just you know keep your head down and uh, trust me, there are deals out there that cash flow. Just focus on that and not on the exit. Yep, and we have a lot of people talking about selling on the chat right now. And you know, should they sell or should they rent their place? And Derek said he wouldn't sell assets right now unless he could take profits and put them in a better deal. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, guys, the there's nothing wrong with taking money off the table, but uh, to Derek's point, you want to be able to put it somewhere. If you're moving into cash with nine percent inflation, it's probably not a good idea. So you again, these are these are you want to keep them in hard assets. Now we don't know. Um, you real estate's fickle, you know, and and, and as uh, uh, it's possible that prices go down, and if you need the cash to live on, then you might want to consider it. Right, right, and and make sure it's in a, you know a good place. People want to rent that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Livy is asking, I'm looking at some properties and running the numbers and it doesn't add up. If I do a down payment of 20% and finance the remaining 80%, the property is a negative cash flow. But if I put half the money down and only finance 50%, there is a cash flow. Is there a drawback to paying such a high down payment? It's an excellent, insightful question. So if, if you're sitting on that much cash and you're not raising it from somebody else, I probably would do that deal. I probably would put more cash down and try to get as low a rate I could and lock it and and cash flow because I would rather personally be in a hard asset than be in cash. We just did this. Mm -hmm. So we just we just I, I, I was heavy in cash because of the, the cycling that we do on our deals and refinancing and all that kind of stuff. The the difference is most of mine are, are tax free cash out refis. So I'm sitting on cash. But, um, uh, you know, they're from, I still own the asset. So that, that's the difference. But I'm still moving that back into hard assets. So we've been buying um, a property in Scottsdale uh, because I don't want to be that heavy in cash. Yeah, and I mean, exactly. Like, if you're sitting on all that cash, you got to put it somewhere. It's just going to lose value in the bank. At least you're making a return on it uh, if you're putting a bigger yeah. down payment down. I, I, and that's what a lot of people are doing right now, you know, because it is hard to find cash flowing properties at 20% down. Yeah, the, the issue is you just look at the difference between what you're making in the bank versus inflation, and that's it. So if we continue to have high inflation and, and Powell is correct, it's 18 to 24 months where, you know, as the, it's going to take them, uh, you know, you could be, we could be looking at, uh, and by the way, when, when they, when they reported 9.1% inflation recently, I, I want to be clear that that's annualized inflation. So what that really means is the last few months are pretty high <laughs> because, uh, you know, going a year year ago, inflation was significantly below nine. So, um, so it's going to be very interesting to see where these inflationary numbers end up. Exactly. Uh, Andy wants to know on from our Ken's in our circle. What is the what is your view on Boxable, which is a new company building affordable and foldable houses on an assembly line, four hundred square feet, fifty thousand dollars, move in ready. I love the idea. I think that uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I know lots of people have tried this, and um, I hope they're successful. Well, uh, the, the problem is it's not the um, house that's super hard. It's the land. you got to put that somewhere, and you're either going to pay somebody rent to put it somewhere, or you're going to have to live out way outside the city because most city ordinances don't let you put something that small on a plot yeah. of land. These used to be called mobile homes, but apparently they're called boxable now. Yeah, they're, so. they're called tiny homes, <laughs> yeah. you know, all that. And it's but, funny, our friend with the mobile home park, he was like, tiny homes are just an expensive mobile home, yeah. you know? <laughs> but the it's a it's a good, the point is, the $50,000 number is 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 kind of the point. Mm -hmm. and, and if you can provide housing, uh, don't forget, 400 square feet of 50 grand is over 1,000 a foot. <laughs> just an FYI. Um, that's a lot. But, uh, if uh, it can solve some people's issues, uh, you know, from affordability standpoint, and they can lock their number in, um, you know, God bless them. Yep. Uh, Eric said, um, hi, Ken. I own an LLC, owns a two-bedroom condo that is currently rented for $925 for 
uh, my tenants. And basically, they are way undervalued. So they could be running it for 1500 Oh, wow. So their question is, we like the idea of having a good, stable, long-term tenant, but rent is far below market. How much would you raise the rent in a situation like this? Yeah, I, I would hate to say, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I, quite honestly, you know, we have properties that are senior properties that, you know, are under market and we've chosen, we're still cash flowing, not, not to, not to jack that rent just because a lot of them are on fixed income. Um, and then we have other properties that are really in affluent areas and people are driving in and out and, you know, nice cars and stuff like that and stuff that we built new where we might be a little more aggressive. Uh, it's really a landlord's choice. It's market driven. If you're $600 under market, then you've made some real mistakes actually uh, on the renewals. And uh, you did that. Wow. Yeah, I learned the hard way on this. Listen, so, you know, it's a business, right? And you got to treat it like a business. Your tenants making more money, I can guarantee it, than they were four years ago um, because everyone's wages and stuff have went up. But, you know, if you raise it to rent now and you raise it five or six hundred dollars, they're going to be pissed at you. Right. Yeah. But and they should be because, you know, you just jacked them. They, they haven't budgeted this. Right. So now they have this six hundred dollar a month cost they hadn't budgeted. And I did this to my tenant. I raised it nine hundred because what I did was I didn't raise it on her for two or three years because of the pandemic. And like you, I felt bad. But then I'm way under market. So now I have to raise it on her 900. So now she's upset with me because she now has to budget this extra expense when I should have raised it on her like two two fifty a year and kind of gradually got there. Um, so, you know, the other thing that happened to you is your expenses went up. Well, my expenses went up during that time. So it, you, you, you were actually going backwards because yep. you, you were barely raising rent and your expenses were My handyman were go- costs were going up. My like, HOA yes, went up. My right. insurance went up. Taxes, all of right. it. So you, you went negative during that period of time. And, but and, then the other thing is you have to think about is some of these cities, you know, you have to prepare that rent control could happen. It could happen anywhere. It could happen in a blue state, a red state, doesn't matter. So if the rent control happens and you're under market on your rent, then you're kind of screwed because you only be able to raise it, you know, 5% or 10% or whatever they allow you every single year. So you really need to get that rent up to market. Yeah. Yeah. And how far that's completely up to you. It's, it's honestly, if you're cash flowing very well and you have a plan, you could do six months, you could do six month leases and just communicate with your tenant. Um, or you could, if they're a pain in your butt, you could rip the bandaid off and raise them to market and, uh, and get a new one in there. Yeah. So but it's you, just, you definitely need to start raising it. You, you know, this is a business, you know, it's your business and you know, there's other things you can do to be really nice, but you, yeah. you know, it's, it's your business. Yeah. Um, AZ said that they're interested in getting involved in real estate, but and they're going to get their real estate license, not to sell houses, just so they have it and can do their own investments. Um, but they're hearing that you have to hang it with a broker. So they are concerned about having to pay for that and, every, and, and how all that works. Sure. So my sister did this, uh, and this is, I think, a fantastic idea. So my son is actually going to do this. So my son, um, one of my sons has decided to get his real estate license and we've been talking to him about it over the last couple months. Uh, as you guys know, who are parents, you know, my kid doesn't think I know anything about real estate, which is awesome. And, uh, and so, but he finally started asking me about real estate and, um, uh, so he's getting his real estate license and, um, the, yes, you do. If as a real estate salesperson, you have to hang your license with a broker. There are lots and lots of options here, but you think about it. The broker actually has liability for you as a salesperson. So I've had salesperson license and I've had brokers licenses in many States and, and the broker is on the hook for the salesman. So what I would do if I were you is I would find a broker that, um, uh, by the way, most of these are commission based. So you, you can find a broker where literally they, the broker just gets a percentage of whatever deals you do. And, uh, that's, that would be probably the lowest cost, but most brokers are going to say, well, why would I do that? Uh, what are you going to, you know, what are you going to be using it for? So, um, but I would, I would latch on to something that has a very, very good educational program to it. So, 
Uh, there's a lot of really good real estate companies out there with brokerages that uh, you could hang with, and and you'll be able to, and you know, so maybe you maybe you should look at it as a as a way to get financially educated on real estate through this company, and you pay a small fee to hang your to hang your license there because they're it's they're, not a lot. No, it, it can't be too much. But um, uh, congratulations on on taking that step. It's a good one. So Tina wants to know, she said, I rent a place with my boyfriend. He wants to go in and buy a home together, but we aren't married. What do you suggest? So um, this happens a lot. Uh, It's a great question, actually. These are some good questions today. I know. Uh, Protect yourself. Do an LLC with you each owning 50% of the LLC. That's it. So. So let's say the down payment's fifty grand, and you both put twenty five in. Make sure that you uh, create a you know boyfriend and girlfriend comma LLC, and and you uh, and you put the money in, and it's very clear because uh, the, obviously the issue is um, there's a lot, but one is if you guys don't stay together, you're gonna want to make sure that that money's protected and that you own half of that. Um, you also own half of the liability, so don't forget about that. So if you buy something that goes down, then um, and uh, let's say he wants to sell, then y- y- you have that issue. So there's a lot of issues around um, the future of the deal itself. If you guys are still together, who owns the house? But the truth is, is um, if if you're on title and and you are protected there, um, you know at exit, whatever that means. Uh, typically you're looking at, at the equity, um, then uh, you'll be protected. But the one thing is on the operating expenses. So uh, think about that. So. so I have a little question before yeah. you keep going. What if like he decides that he no longer wants to pay his part of the mortgage? Is yeah. she kind of stuck with that? That all has to be in the operating agreement inside of the LLC. So it's a very good question. Those are all, these are all real things, guys. Let's say, let's say he moves out and you're sitting there and you can't pay the mortgage or you, or you move out and he can't pay the mortgage and can't get a roommate or doesn't want a roommate. And, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, and, or what if they break up? Like who has to, like, what if neither one of them want to move out? How does that work? Uh, well, that's, uh, that's, uh, has nothing to do with the operating agreement. I have a very sure. different opinion than Ken. Okay. Tina, get a real business partner to invest in a house <laughs> with you and let him live there, but do not go into it with him because now you're like, um, combining personal and business and just buy the house on your own or get a partner. But I just think it gets sticky. I've heard of things and I just, I think I you, wouldn't do uh, that. I disagree. I think you put it in the operating agreement and you stick everything in there. You, you talk about uh, what happens in all those scenarios and, and uh, you button it up just like you would a lease. Okay. I love, uh, <laughs> I love that we disagreed on that one. Well, and Melissa just asked, what about investing with your sister? Same thing. Just keep the keep it business and keep the personal out of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it depends, uh, you know, if your sister's rich. Oh, good. <laughs> Jamie said, my brother bought a house with his girlfriend and they broke up and the house was caught in the middle and it was horrible. It destroyed her finances and his life for years. So, yeah. Guys, Jamie, nice. <laughs> Way to go. Jamie showed up. Okay. I guess one for Daniel. Let's I- high five on that one. All right. Awesome. Well, oh, and one last question, because I promised Pavel I'd get to it. What percentage of your stocks is your portfolio stocks versus real estate? Very little. So uh, I do dabble in them, but I kind of look at them. (laughs) I know this is horrible to say, but I feel like stocks are kind of like crypto (laughs) for me, (laughs) where I just I don't know. I don't understand. Them. I don't know how can a how can a company be losing money and the stock go up? And I know it has to do with people buying it and selling it. And, but uh, back in the old days, it used to represent the profitability of a company. <laughs> so uh, you know, I'm not the guy to talk about. It. But I do have some, and yeah, you uh, do have a little I, bit. I, yeah, I like some Very oil, oil and gas royalty stuff and tech stuff, and you know. But I I don't really look at the stock market as as um, you know, uh, uh, providing me any kind of financial freedom. Awesome. Well, thank you. Guys. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Real Estate Strategies podcast. If you liked what you heard, please give us a five star review on iTunes and let us know what you thought of today's episode. Want to take the next step as a real estate investor? Join our free community and gain access to dozens of beginner courses, blogs, weekly insider updates, and much more. Visit KenMcElroy.com slash podcast. Thank you, and we'll see you next week.